Switzerland. Carl Gustav Jung. Born in 1875. With Freud, one of the founding fathers of modern psychology. Still working at 84, he is the most honored living psychiatrist and history will record him as one of the greatest physicians of all time. How many years have you lived in this lovely house by the lake at Zurich? It's just about 50 years. Um, do you live here now just with your secretaries and your English housekeeper? Yes. No children or grandchildren with you? Oh, no, they don't live here, but I have plenty of them in the surroundings. Do they come to see you often? Oh, yes. How many grandchildren have oh, you? Oh, 19. And great-grandchildren? Oh. I think eight, and uh, I suppose one is on the way. And do they? Uh, do you enjoy having them? Well, of course, it's nice to to feel such a living crowd around of one's, oneself. Are they afraid of you? Do you think? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. If you would know my grandchildren, they wouldn't think so. <laughs> what? They steal by things. Even my hat that belongs to me that I stole the other day. <laughs> now, can I take you back to your own childhood? Do you remember the occasion when you first felt consciousness of your own individual self? That was in my 11th year. There I suddenly, on my way to school, I stepped out of a mist. It was just as if I had been in a mist, walking in a mist, and I stepped out of it, and I knew I am. I am what I am. And then I thought, but what ha have I been before? And then I found that I was, that I had been in a mist, not knowing to differentiate myself from things. I was just one thing about among, among many things. Now, was that associated with any particular episode in your life, or was it just a normal function of adolescence? Well, uh, that's difficult to say. Uh, as far as I can remember, nothing had happened before that would explain this sudden coming to consciousness. You hadn't, for instance, been quarreling with your parents or anything? No, no. no. Uh, what memories have you of, of your parents? Were they strict and old-fashioned in the way they brought you up? Oh, well, you know, they belonged uh, to the later parts of the Middle Ages. And uh, my father was uh, a parson in the country, and, uh, and uh, you can imagine uh, they, uh, what people were then, you know, in the 70s of the past century, they had the convictions in which uh, people have lived since uh, 1,800 years. How did he try to impress these convictions on you? Did he punish you, for instance? Oh, no, not no. at all. No, he was very liberal, I, and he was most tolerant, most understanding. Uh, which did you get on with more, more intimately, your father or your mother? That's difficult to say. In, of course, one is always more intimate with the mother. Uh, but when it comes to the personal feeling, I had a better relation to my father, who was predictable, than with my mother, who was 
uh, to me, uh, a very problemat problematical something. So, at any rate, fear was not an element in your relation with your father? Uh, not at all. Did you accept him as being infallible in his judgments? Oh, no, I knew he was very fallible. How, how old were you when you knew that? Now, let me see. Uh, 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 yeah, I, perhaps 11 or 12 years old. It, uh, it was hanging together with the fact that I was, that I knew I was. And from then on, I saw that my father is different. Yes. So the, you know, the moment of self-revelation was closely connected with realizing the fallibility of your parents. Uh, yes, one could say so. Now, what about... But I realized that I had fear of my mother, but not during the day. There she was quite uh, known to me and predictable, but in the night I had fear of my mother. And can you remember why? Can you remember what that period? I have not the slightest idea why. No. What about your school days now? Were you happy at school as a schoolboy? In, in the beginning, I was very happy to have a, a companions, you know, because before I had been very lonely. We lived in the country, and um, uh, I had no... No, no brother and no sister. My sister was born very much later, when I was nine years old. And so I was used to be alone, but I missed it. I missed company. And in school it was wonderful to have company. But soon, um, you know, in a country school, naturally, I, I, I was far ahead. And, and then I began to be bored. What sort of religious upbringing did your father give you? Oh, we were Swiss reformed. And did he make you attend church regularly? Oh, well, that was quite natural. Yes. Everybody went to, 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 to church yes. on Sunday. And did you believe in God? Oh, yes. Do you now believe in God? Uh, now? Difficult to answer. I know. I, need, I don't need to believe. I know. Well, now, Turning to the next uh, staging point in your life, what made you decide to become a doctor? That was in the first place uh, a merely opportunistic choice. I really, originally, I wanted to be an archaeologist, uh, Assyriology, Egyptology, or something of the sort. I hadn't the money. The, the study was too expensive. So, I, uh, my second love then belonged to nature, particularly uh, zoology. And I want, I, when I began my studies, I inscribed in the uh, so-called philosophical faculty two, that means uh, natural sciences. But then I soon uh, saw uh, that the post my, of the, car the career that uh, was before me uh, uh, would uh, make a schoolmaster of me, you see. But I, didn't, I never thought I had any chance uh, to, to, to get any further because we had no money at all. And then I, uh, uh, I saw that that, did, that didn't suit my uh, expectations, you know. I, I, I didn't want to become a, a schoolmaster. Uh, teaching was not just what I was looking for. And so I remember that my grandfather has been a, a doctor, and, uh, and I knew that when I was studying medicine, I had a chance to study natural science and uh, to become a doctor, and a doctor can develop, you see. He can have a practice, he can, do, uh, he can choose his scientific interests more or less. Uh, at all events, I would have more chance than being a schoolmaster, also the idea of doing something useful with human beings appealed to me. And did you, when you decided to become a doctor, have difficulty in getting the training at school and in passing the exams? Uh, I particularly had a difficulty with certain teachers uh, that didn't believe that I could write a decent thesis. I remember one case 
where the teacher had the custom to, the habit to uh, discuss the papers written by the, the, the pupils. Uh, and he took the best first. And he went through the whole uh, number of uh, the pupils and I, I didn't appear, and I, I was uh, uh, badly troubled over it. And I thought, well, it is impossible that my thesis can be that bad. And uh, when he had finished, he said, there is still one paper left over, and that is the one by Jung. That would be by far the best paper if it hadn't been copied. He has, he has just copied it somewhere, stolen. You are a thief, Jung. And if I knew where you had, uh, have stolen it, you, uh, you, I would fling you out of school. And I, I was mad and I uh, said, uh, this is uh, the one thesis where I have worked the most, because the, the theme was interesting. In contradistinction, you know, to other themes which are not at all interesting to me. And, uh, and then he said, you are a liar. And if you can prove that you have stolen that thing somewhere, then you get out of school. Now, that was a very serious thing to me, because what else then, you see? And uh, I hated that fellow, and that was the, the only man I could have killed, you know. If I had met him once at the dark corner, I would have shown him something of what I could do. Did you often have violent thoughts about people when you were young? No, not exactly. Only when I got mad. Uh, well, then I beat them up. And did you often get mad? Not so often, but uh, then for good. Uh, you, were, <laughs> you were very strong and big, I imagine. Yes, I was pretty strong. And, you know, uh, reared in the country with those peasant boys it was a rough kind of life. And, and I, I, I would, would have been capable of, 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 of violence, I know. I was a bit afraid of it. So I, I rather tried to avoid the critical situations <laughs> because I didn't trust myself. Once I was attacked by uh, about uh, seven boys and I got mad and I took one and just swung him round with his legs, you know, and, and, and beat down four of them. And then they, they were satisfied. And were there any uh, consequences from that after? Oh, you, uh, well, I should say, yes. Uh, from then on, uh, I was always, always suspected that I was at the bottom of every trouble. I was not, but uh, they were afraid, and I was never attacked again. Well, now, when the time came that you qualified as a doctor, what made you decide to specialize in being an alienist? Yeah, that was rather an interesting point. When I, I had finished my studies practically, and when I um, uh, uh, didn't know what I really wanted to do, I had a big chance uh, for, uh, to follow one of my professors. He was called to a new position in Munich, and he wanted me as his assistant. And and th but then, in that moment, I uh, studied for my final examination. Um, I came across the textbook, a textbook of uh, psychiatry. Up to then, I thought nothing about it, because our professor then wasn't particularly interesting. And I, read, I only read the introduction to that book, where certain things were said uh, about uh, psychosis as a maladjustment of the personality. That hit the nail on the head. In that moment, I saw I must become an alienist. My heart was thumping wildly in that moment. Uh, and uh, when I told my professor I, I wouldn't follow him, I would study uh, psychiatry, uh, he couldn't understand it. No, my, uh, my friends, uh, because in those days psychiatry was, was nothing, nothing at all. But I saw one, the one great chance to unite certain uh, uh, 
contrasting things in myself, namely, beside medicine, beside natural science, I always had studied uh, history of philosophy and such subjects. Uh, it was just as if suddenly two streams were uh, joining. And how long was it after you took that decision that you first came in contact with Freud? Oh, you know, that was at the end of my studies, and, and then it took quite a while until I met Freud. You see, I finished my studies in 1900, and I met Freud uh, only very much later by, uh, I read, uh, well, I, in 1900, I already read uh, his three interpretation, and the prior Freud studies uh, about uh, hysteria, but that was merely literary, you know. And then in 1907, I became acquainted with him personally. Will you tell me how that happened? Did you go to Vienna? To oh, well, him? I'd written a book about the psychology of uh, the Mensch of Precock, as one called Schizophrenia then. Uh, and uh, I sent him that book and thus became acquainted. I went, I went to Vienna for a fortnight then, and then we had a very uh, uh, long and penetrating conversations, and uh, that settled it. And this long and penetrating conversation was followed by personal friendship? Oh, yes. It soon developed into a personal friendship. And what sort of man was Freud? Well, he was a complicated nature, you know. He, I liked him very much, and, but I soon discovered that when he had thought something, then it was settled, while I was doubting all along the line. And uh, it, it was impossible to discuss something really a fond. You know, he had no uh, philosophical education, particularly you see, I was studying Kant, and uh, I was steeped in it, and, uh, and that was far from Freud. So, uh, from the very beginning, there was a discrepancy. Did you, in fact, grow apart later, partly because of a difference in temperamental approach to experiment and proof and so on? Well, of course, there is always a temperamental difference, um, and uh, his approach was uh, naturally different from mine because his personality was different from mine. That led me in, into my later investigation of psychological types. There are uh, definite attitudes. Uh, some people are doing it in this way and other people are doing it in the other typical way. And there were such differences between myself and Freud too. Do you consider that Freud's standard of proof and experimentation was less high than your own? Well, I, uh, you see, that is uh, an evaluation uh, I'm not competent of. Uh, uh, I'm not my own history or my uh, historiographer. I, uh, in, with reference to certain results, uh, I think, uh, my method has uh, its merits. Tell me, did Freud himself ever analyze you? Uh, yeah, oh, yes. I had, uh, submitted quite a lot of my dreams to him. And yeah. so did he. And he to you, yes. Oh, yes. 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 Um, what, do you remember now, at this distance of time, what were the significant features of Freud's dreams that you noted at the time? Well, that is rather indiscreet to ask. You know, I have, there is such a thing as a professional secret. He's been dead these uh, many years. Uh, I, yeah, yes, but uh, uh, these uh, regards last longer than life. Uh, <laughs> I prefer not to talk about it. Well, may I ask you something else then, which perhaps is also indiscreet. Is it true that you have a very large number of letters which you exchanged with Freud, which are still unpublished? Yes. When are they going to be published? Well, uh, not during my lifetime. You would have no objection to them being published after your life? Oh, no, not at all. Because they are probably of great historical importance. I don't think so.
then it, wh why have you not published them so far? Because they were not important to me e enough. I see no particular importance in, uh, in them. They are concerned with personal matters? Well, partially. Uh, but I wouldn't care to, to, to publish them. Well, now, can we move on to the time when you did eventually uh, part company with Freud? Uh, it was partly, I think, with the publication of your book, The Psychology of the Unconscious. Is that correct? That is, that is what was the real cause. Well, now, before you... Oh, I mean the, the, the final cause, because it had a long preparation. You know, from the beginning, I had a reservatio mentalis. I couldn't uh, agree with uh, quite a number of his uh, ideas. Which ones in particular? Well, uh, chiefly his purely personal approach and his disregard of uh, the historical conditions of man. You see, we depend largely upon our history. Uh, we are shaped through education, through the influence of the parents, which are by no means always personal. They were prejudiced or they were influenced by historical ideas or what I call dominance. And, uh, and that is uh, a most decisive factor in psychology. And we are not of today or of yesterday. We are of an immense age. Was it not partly your observation, your clinical observation, of psychotic cases which led you to differ from Freud on this? It was partially my experience with, with uh, schizophrenic patients that uh, led me uh, to the idea of certain general historical conditions. Is there any one case that you can now look back on and feel that perhaps it was the turning point of your thought? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, I made quite a number of experiences of that sort, and I went uh, even to Washington to uh, study uh, Negroes at the psychiatric clinic there in order to find out whether they have the same type of dreams as we have. Uh, and uh, these experiences and others led me then to the hypothesis that there is an impersonal stratum in our psyche. And uh, I can tell you an example. We had a, pa uh, a patient uh, in the ward. He was quiet, but uh, completely dissociated, uh, schizophrenic. And he was uh, in the clinic already for over 20 years. He had come into the clinic, as a matter of fact, uh, being a young man, uh, a little clerk, and, uh, and did no particular education. And once, I came into the ward and, and he was obviously excited and called to me, took me by the label of my coat and led me to the window uh, and said, Doctor, now, now you must see. Uh, now look at it. Look up at the sun uh, and see uh, how it moves. You see, you must move your head too like this and then you will see the, uh, the follows of the sun. And, uh, you know, that's the origin of the wind. And you see how the sun moves as you move your head from one side to the other. Now, of course, I didn't understand it at all. I thought, oh, there you are. He's just crazy. Uh, and, but that case remained in my mind. And four years later, uh, I uh, came across uh, a paper written by the German um, historian E. Uh, Dietrich, um, who had uh, dealt with, uh, with the so-called Mitras literature, a part of the great uh, Parisian sorcerer papyrus. And there he uh, produced the, uh, uh, a part of the so-called Mitras liturgy. Namely, uh, it is said there, after the second prayer, thou wilt see the, how the disk of the sun unfolds. And you will see 
hanging down from it, the tube, the origin of the wind. And when you move thy face, thy face to the regions of the east, it will move there. And if you move your face to the region of the west, it will follow you. And instantly, I know, I knew, now this is it. This is the vision of my patient. But how could you be sure that your patient wasn't unconsciously recalling something that somebody had told him? Oh, no, quite out of question, because that thing was not known. It was in a, in a, in a magic papyrus in Paris, in the, uh, and it, it wasn't even published. It was only published four years later after I had observed it with my patient. And this, you felt, proved that there was a, a, an unconscious, which was something more than personal. Oh, well, that was not a proof to me, but it was a hint. And I took the hint. Yes. Now, tell me, how did you st first decide to start your work on the psychological types? Was that also as a result of some particular clinical experience? Uh, less so. It was a very personal reason, namely to do justice to the psychology of Freud, also to that of Adler, and to find my own bearings. Uh, that helped me to understand why Freud developed such a theory, or why Adler developed his theory, his power principle. Have you concluded what psychological type you are yourself? Naturally, I have devoted a great deal of attention to that. <laughs> Painful question, you know. And reached a conclusion? Well, you see, the, the type is nothing static. It, uh, it changes with, in the course of life. Uh, but I most certainly uh, was characterized by thinking. I always thought, from early childhood on. And uh, I had a great deal of intuition, too. And I had a definite difficulty with feeling. Uh, and uh, my relation to reality was not particularly brilliant. I was often at variance with the reality of things. Now, that gives you all the necessary data for, 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 for uh, the diagnosis. During the 1930s, when you were working a lot with German patients, you did, I believe, forecast that uh, a Second World War was very likely. Well, now, looking at the world today, do you feel that a Third World War is likely? Uh, I have no definite indications in that respect. But there are so many indications that one doesn't know what one sees. Is it trees or is it the wood? It's very difficult to say. Uh, because the, the dreams of uh, people's dreams contain apprehensions, you know. But it is very difficult to say uh, whether they point to a war, because that idea is uppermost in people's mind. Formerly, you know, it has been much simpler. People didn't think of a war. And therefore, it was rather clear what the dreams meant. Nowadays, no more so. We are so full of apprehensions, fears, that one doesn't know exactly to what it points. But one thing is sure, a great change of our psychological attitude is imminent. That is certain. Uh, why? Because we need more. We need more psychology. We need more understanding of human nature, because the only real danger that exists is man himself. He is the great danger, and we are pitifully unaware of it. We know nothing of man, far too little. His psyche should be studied, because we are the origin of all coming evil. Well, does man, do you think, need to have the concept of sin and evil to live with? Is this part of our nature? Well, obviously. And of a redeemer? That is a, an inevitable consequence. 
This is not a, a, a concept which will disappear as we become more rational. It's something which Well, I don't believe that man ever will uh, deviate uh, from the original pattern of his being. There will always be such ideas. For instance, uh, if you d do not directly believe in a personal redeemer, as it was the case with Hitler, or uh, the hero worship in Russia, uh, then it is an idea. It is a, uh, a symbolic idea. Um, you, you have written at one time or another some sentences which have surprised me a little about death. Now, in particular, I, I remember you said that death is psychologically just as important as birth. And like it, it's an integral part of life. But surely it can't be like birth if it's an end, can it? Yes, if it's an end. And there we are not quite certain uh, about this end. Because, you know, there are these uh, peculiar faculties of the psyche that it isn't entirely confined to, to space and time. You can have dreams or visions of the future. You can see round corners and such things. Only ignorance deny these, uh, these facts. These are, it's quite evident that they do exist and have existed always. Now, these facts be, show that the psyche, in part at least, is not dependent upon these confinements. And then what? When the psyche is not under that obligation to live in time and space alone, and obviously it doesn't, then in, uh, to that extent the psyche is not submitted to those laws. And uh, that means uh, a, a practical uh, um, in, uh, continuation of life, of a sort of psychical existence uh, beyond time and space. Do you yourself believe that death is probably the end, or do you, do you believe that... Well, I, I can't say... You see, the word belief is a, dif a difficult thing for me. I don't believe. I must have a reason uh, to, for, for a certain hypothesis. Either I know a thing, and when I know it, I don't be need to believe it. If I... I don't allow myself, for instance, to be believe a thing just for the sake of believing it. Uh, I, I can't believe it, but when there are sufficient reasons to, for a certain hypothesis, I shall accept these reasons, naturally. I should say, we have to reckon with the possibility of so-and-so, uh, you know. Well, now, you've told us that we should regard death as being a goal. Yes. And that to shrink away from it is to evade life and yes. live life purposely. Yes. What advice would you give to people in their later life to enable them to do this when most of them must in fact believe that death is the end of everything? Mm -hmm. Well, you see, it is, you know, I have treated many old people, and it's quite interesting to, to watch what the unconscious is doing with the fact that it is apparently threatened with a complete end. Uh, it disregards it. it. Life behaves as if it were going on. And... Uh, so I think it is better for old people to live on, to, to look forward to the next day, uh, as if uh, he had to spend centuries. And then he lives properly. But when he is afraid, when he doesn't look forward, when he looks back, he petrifies, he, he, he gets uh, stiff and and uh, he dies before his time. But when he is living on, looking forward to the great adventure that is ahead, then he lives. And that is about what the unconscious is intending to do. Of course, it's quite obvious that we are all going to, to die, and this is uh, the, the, the sad fi finale of everything. Um, but uh, nevertheless, there is something in us that doesn't believe it, apparently. But it, this is merely a fact, a psychological fact. Uh, for, for doesn't mean to me that it proves something. It is simply so. For instance, I may not know why we need salt. 
but we prefer to eat salt too, because you feel better. And so when you think in a certain way, you may feel considerably better. And I think if you think along the lines of nature, then you think properly. And this leads me to the last question that I want to ask you. As the world becomes more technically efficient, it seems increasingly necessary for people to behave communally and collectively. Now, do you think it's possible that the highest development of man may be to submerge his own individuality in a kind of collective consciousness? That's hardly possible. I think there will be a, a, a reaction. A reaction will set in against uh, this uh, communal uh, uh, dissociation. You know, man doesn't stand forever his nullification. Once there will be uh, a reaction, and uh, I see, I see it setting in. You know, when I think of my patients, they all seek their own existence and to assure their existence against that complete atomization into nothingness or into meaninglessness. Man cannot stand a meaningless life. <laughs>